Good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming to share in this conversation. We will try and keep it brief to um, give as much time as possible for us to uh, have a chat. Um, my name is Maris Tadros, and um, I'm very privileged to convene the Coalition for Religious Equality and Inclusive Development, which is a consortium comprised of partners here and in the Global South. Um, and uh, the partners include Minority Rights Group, represented by Claire here, um, as well as El Ho'i Foundation, uh, represented by Mariam and colleagues here. Um, as well as Rifsemi, represented by Archbishop Angelos, who I think must be somewhere around here, but um, will be coming soon. Um, and uh, we also have about 30 to 40 partners overseas. And our aim was to rethink poverty reduction, social change transformations um, in ways that um, enable people um, to think about themselves and their futures uh, in ways that there isn't a, a kind of hierarchy of rights. Uh, so you have a set of economic and social rights and a set of freedom of religion, of rights and, and so forth. How, how, does, how, does it, how does it look like on the ground? And one of the things we discovered is that we need to think, rethink how we um, know what we know about freedom of religion or belief. And that's what we're going to talk about today, is the importance of rethinking methodologies and approaches um, so that they make sense to the people whose lives we want to see change, that they would be leading the process of change. So we will have a conversation, um, and we have on purpose brought amazing colleagues whose bios you'll find um, um, in the program, who come from very different backgrounds to tell us why we need to uh, rethink what we know about freedom of religion or belief if we're really serious about putting people whose lives matter at the center um, uh, of processes of change. So um, I'm going to ask the same question for colleagues and have a conversation about it. Um, and I'm going to start uh, with Joe. Um, tell us about, from your background, um, what, why, why is uh, religious inequalities of freedom of religion or belief being such a blind spot in development? You have 20 years experience in development and why does it matter? Thank you, Mariz. Um, well, my background is um, participatory research and participatory methodologies and I've worked for many years in, with participatory processes both in NGOs and in research institutions. And in that tradition, um, I think we look at intersecting inequalities, which we'll come on to later, and their methodologies really lend themselves to uncovering different types of different drivers of inequalities. However, for me, I think working with Creed has, um, with, with this program has really helped me to identify my own blind spot, because I've been working with intersecting inequalities for years, and often religion and belief are not things that we really foreground. We're, and I think this is both true for myself, I recognize, and for my sector, participatory research, and for the development sector more broadly. And this is, in, at least in participatory research, I think it goes back to uh, traditions which have to do with uncovering social inequalities, um, challenging colonialism, and which uh, are rooted often in Marxist traditions and have a kind of a, a, quite a deliberate blind spot when it comes to religion or belief. And these need to be addressed. So I think working on this has really helped me to, to recognize that religion and belief are fundamentally important in people's lives. And I'd like to talk a little bit more later when we come back to it about how, what that looks like in terms of intersecting inequalities. Thank you. Um, Becky, you are an economist uh, who has been working very strongly on promoting freedom of religion or belief. What is it about this topic and the approach? Uh, why has it been a blind spot and, and how have a, a change of approaches to understanding people's realities that is different from a conventional economist approach contributed to your work in this area? Thank you, Maris. Um, uh, so my standpoint is, as you said, an economist, and I'm based in India, in northeast Bangalore, and my career has, uh, has been involved in, in examining sort of the impact of religion and the lives of the very poor in India. And uh, just to begin with, I might offer an understanding of what freedom is of religion or belief is, in my view. And to borrow Isaiah Berlin's sort of... Uh, famous distinction between negative liberty and positive liberty makes no sense. Freedom of religion makes no sense except as a positive liberty. Um, 
freedom of religion or belief, FORB, to save time, is not primarily uh, autonomy for its own sake or freedom from constraint. Freedom of religion or belief is at its core. It is for achieving a relationship or harmony with an order of reality that is superhuman or superworldly. In that sense, it's sort of like the freedom of the press, the freedom of the press, which is ultimately teleological or positive, which doesn't exist primarily to remove constraints on the production or the consumption of the media, but it is there, it exists so that there is healthy and open debate. And freedom of religion or belief, as we understand it, as I understand it, is, is in, in a sense, uh, this, uh, this liberty that is, seeks, enables people to seek a relationship. So from what I've said, freedom, you may already see there is this blind spot between freedom of religion and belief or development. And development theory in late modern West operates within what Charles Taylor says it ta calls the imminent frame. Not imminent as in approaching, but immanent as in secular and uh, this-worldly. So there is an immediate disconnect between freedom of religion or belief and development theory, uh, it, the subject matter and the orientation of this, because in the research that I did with Creed uh, in the last 24 months during COVID, we discovered that the, the poor, and the, I'm, I'm talking about, we did many focus groups, the poor, uh, Dalit Muslim men in Korukupet slum in northeast, uh, north Chennai, saw their relationship with the mosque, saw their relationship with their religious institution as five times more an important an enabler during this terrible time of COVID than their relationship with even their, than the government and three times more important than their relationship with their families. So freedom of religion or belief, development theory, a disconnect, and what we've done with Creed and our research sort of grounds this empirically. So in my view, Maris, that is where I see the blind spot. So important because you're talking about if development is about strengthening people's coping strategies, how can you strengthen people's coping strategies if you don't look at what counts in their lives and what helps them in times of crises like COVID? And I want to turn to Judd because you have a very uh, interesting background, which uh, you'll tell us about. And how is it that from uh, the particulars, which I will I'll let you talk about it, from that background, you've very kindly be, been able to sort of say, yes, we need to talk about freedom of religion and belief also as religious inequalities in development and, and also you were able to engage uh, with development from a very different point of view from where you stand. So tell us a little bit about your background about, and also how you, how you see um, this issue of blind spots and language and, and so forth. Sure. Well, thank you, Maurice, and, and thanks to all of you for being here uh, this morning. It's a pleasure to, to be here with you and I so much respect all the good work that's represented just here in this room. Um, from my vantage point, as someone who, who served at the State Department and uh, who's been working with diplomats over the past decade uh, plus, I think there's, a, there's, on the one hand, a lot of good news about uh, growing attention to religion uh, within foreign ministries, within development agencies and organizations, a lot of um, uh, aid agencies incorporating analysis of religion, incorporating engagement with religious actors as part of the design and impl implementation process of of uh, development uh, projects. But our, our specific focus for this panel and really for this ministerial is not religion in general or religious engagement in general, but rather freedom of religion or belief uh, more specifically. And attentiveness to religion is not the same thing as um, attentiveness to freedom of religion or belief. Uh, and that argument is articulated very powerfully and effectively uh, by Maurice in a, in a, in a recent article uh, in the journal, The Review of Faith and International Affairs, a journal that I serve as an editorial fellow, so I highly commend the journal. Our editor is here somewhere, <laughs> and highly commend specifically the, uh, the, um, the, that article. But if I, so, all, all I really want to do in this moment now is just highlight one particular um, argument that Maurice makes in that article that really resonated with my own uh, experience and really my own concern, and that is that typically uh, development agencies 
uh, have their religious engagement grounded in a recognition that in all societies there are religious groups or leaders who are highly influential and thus highly relevant to development outcomes and thus important to engage. On the, on the, conversely, uh, most FORB advocacy is focused on religious groups that are highly not influential because they have a marginalized minority status, perhaps even actively discriminated against or, or even persecuted in some sort of violent way. Um, and so there's a, there's a tendency to, to engage with different sorts of, uh, of, 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 of communities. Uh, and that engagement with uh, marginalized groups, as we all know well, can often be very, very sensitive, sensitive very fraught, um, can often be perceived as, uh, as a sectarian thing or partisan or perceived by some as sort of a, a neo-colonial project. And so for a lot of development agencies who are dealing with billions of pounds or euros or dollars and just want to get the work done, uh, they, they uh, tend to work with influential majorities that are just safer in context uh, to work with. And so there, there can be a disconnect between development practitioners and for practitioners in terms of the communities they're looking to reach and engage with and the outcomes they're, they're trying to seek. So more work needs to be done, building on the good work that Creed has done to, to foster greater mutual awareness and, and collaboration uh, between these different uh, communities. And I'm very grateful for the work that, that Creed and the colleagues here have already done um, in that direction. Thank you, George. I think one of the approaches has been the intersecting inequalities, which is uh, in order for us to avoid the very important point that Judd was referring to, and which actually is, uh, uh, Judd has an amazing article critiquing methodologies of freedom of religion and belief because of their perpetuation of these us and them, or this idea of blocks of people without looking at the differences within different communities. And these differences we call intersecting inequalities, which is how uh, class and caste and where you're based and your gender and your ethnicity and, and sometimes your language, all of these factors influence how you experience both power and powerlessness. And it's a very dynamic process. And um, um, Jod has an amazing article talking about the importance of looking at these differences so that we don't create an us and them kind of approach. And for us in working in transformations, we try to avoid an us and them approach by looking at intersecting inequalities. And um, perhaps I'll uh, come back to you, Joe, again and say, when it comes to people on the margins who are targeted because of their faith, whether they are practicing or not, but they're associated with something uh, that leads to their otherization, how does intersecting inequalities help us and help development or people committed to social justice and poverty reduction and transformations generally, how does it help us take a sensitive approach that avoids uh, us and them and all kinds of problematic reifications. Yeah. Thank you. And a nice segue from Judd's point. I think, so my work has always focused on people who are living, or working with people who are living in the margins. And the rationale of participatory methodologies is it's a way of researching with people and not on them or and, and as, as non-extractivist as possible. And this is really important because in the research process, you're building knowledge together, you're sharing stories, people are hearing each other's stories, and in hearing those stories, they build, um, they, they increase their understanding of other people's situations, they see across different identities, because even with a group that's all the same religion and the same gender, there will be other differences. And so in that research process, in that group, group process, you can begin to uh, share and understand and analyze together what those different situations are and identify, recognize and respect difference and engage and come together around similarities or, or connect, uh, connections. And that's fundamentally important for that sensitive approach that isn't that, that you, can, you can work with people in ways that are not extractive and that you can be respectful of their processes. I think an aspect there that we found very important in our research is that the person who facilitates that research process needs to be somebody who is deeply embedded with those communities, who understands them, is respected, and has access to them uh, in ways that they can feel safe and, and, and are safe. Um, I think another point, and this I, I, I give thanks to Mariz for helping me to think of, of um, religious otherization as an aspect, as a power relation that is part of the intersecting inequalities that I've studied for many years. And understanding it is as another form of power inequality that intersects with other aspects of people's inequalities. So 
the fact that you are marginalized, stigmatized and discriminated, and Becky will probably talk more about the work we did during the, the pandemic, that people's experiences that the pandemic triggered further discrimination towards religious minorities. But that impact of that on um, people who are economically marginalized was it, it um, amplifies. It's not just an extra thing. It amplifies their situation. And that's, I think, the really important part of intersecting inequalities, that recognition of the amplification. And sorry, I'm going on a little bit long, but the other aspect, and through participatory methodologies where people share their stories and then identify drivers, negative drivers, but also positives, enablers that they, just, that they were able to share in their, their journeys. Um, religion and belief, people's faith was fundamentally important and it made all the difference. And it wasn't, oh, which, en well, sometimes it was which NGO was there to support me. But the first and foremost thing that poor people talked about as a source of support and their vision of development had to do with their faith. I think I should pass over to the Thank you, <laughs> experts Joe. on that one. Thank, Thank you. you. So, Becky, tell us about how, how that concept um, helped you and the people you were working with, because the point about Joe is so important. We need to rethink our relationship with our communities. We don't just do things on their behalf. Uh, we don't just capture their realities and then try and change it. Unless things are done through their leadership, with them at the center of the processes of change, then nothing is really rooted and nothing really has a, an opportunity of being owned. So tell us about that process what did it look like um, in your experience with very many different communities and groups um, that uh, you have been encountering? Well, that's a wonderful question. I wish I could take you in a time machine back <laughs> to uh, March 2021 when we actually conducted the focus groups. And Professor Tadro sitting here is a dear friend of mine. So when she said, go out and about and conduct focus groups in a country where COVID was raging, and the, where the country was locked down, and we need data. Uh, I loved her enough <laughs> to do it. So I went out, and we conducted these focus groups in two of the poorest and most deprived uh, slums and working with Joe. I am not a participatory mo uh, methodology person. I work with large data sets and do statistical analysis. So Joe was my guru, shall we say, in participatory methodology. And so with her help, we went out and do it, did this. So I'll just talk about how empowering the approach is. I mean, may I say that the development world in which I operate makes claims to a great extent about decolonizing development. But when it comes to data, there is very little decolonization, shock. There is very little decolonization, and Claire sitting here will tell you that a lot of it is because disaggregation doesn't happen with data, and when you don't disaggregate data, you don't know who the marginal groups are. So one of the ways in which participatory methods help was to include the people, hand over the baton to the people. And how empowering was it for a Dalit Muslim illiterate woman to say, but I have not touched a pencil in my life. Are you telling me, let me call my granddaughter? She can draw. How can I draw a river of life? We asked them to draw a river of life before and during and after their COVID and draw enablers, which could be fish or constraints, which could be rocks. How can I draw? Dalit men said, ha, 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 are you taking us back to school? And so the whole process of drawing, and there's a whole research written around it, was, was tremendously empowering. That they were able, and in the process, it was a kind of cathartic process as well, that then they drew, they said, oh, we didn't know. And we didn't know this was happening to us. And we kept saying, we are very sorry that we're bringing you here in the middle of the pandemic. And they said, we've not had a chance to talk about this. So the process was tremendously empowering. And the participatory ranking, which is sort of the math of the participatory approach, giving people, enabling them to come together and say what were their enablers and what were their constraints, was tremendously powerful. And as Joe just said, what rose to the top was a relationship with the transcendent. What rose to the top 
was a relationship with religious communities. And this occurred, and Maris and Joe were very great, uh, very um, open when I said, I don't like the binary of minority, majority in India. Mm -hmm. Because within the majority community of Hindus, there are Dalit Hindus. And they are deeply marginalized because India has nationalized temples and nationalized religious institutions. Temples were shut during COVID. They were locked. So a Hindu man or woman couldn't go to the temple to get rice or dal. The Muslim man could go to the mosque, the Christian person could go to the church, but the Hindu could go nowhere. So the Hindu was doubly, triply marginalized in some sense. We don't often think about this when we talk in terms of Forbes. I'm going on. But the whole process was tremendously cathartic. It was a very empowering process. And intersecting inequalities are an empirical fact in India. They are. I won't, don't have time now, but I will, if I could, if there's time, read an excerpt from a focus group where the men, Dalit men, talk, talked openly for the first time since they had been locked down of what the pandemic meant to them and what it, what it was doing to them. It would give you a flavor of what happened uh, in India. Can I read it? If, if there's yes, time? You, yeah, great. Okay. Well, Here I am. So this comes in, in, uh, 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 in the shadow of the Tablighi Jamaat. There was, a, there was a sect in India that was meeting, and the government said that this sect had spread COVID. So every Muslim regardless of where he or she was, was suspected as being a foreign body. Foreign body, you know, a foreign body. Du blonde on there. So participant one, they hunt us down and throw us in jail. Muslims are doing wrong things. Muslims are doing wrong things, they say. They tell us we are breaking the law. That is what we hear all the time. We hear, go back to Pakistan. Participant two, everywhere. It happens everywhere, every day. Participant three, it's happening everywhere. We are exhausted. We, are str we were strong at one point. We could stand up for ourselves. Now we cannot. We are dead. We have no energy. What can we do? We are poor people. We live in the slum. We don't know what to do. This is an excerpt from the participatory approach uh, focus group. And Becky, you were capturing different people's journeys in this yes. time. And, and people were talking about different ways in which they were being affected. Uh, whether, you know, and, and, and there wasn't one block of one effect. People were talking about different ways in which their experiences of marginalization um, were happening. And, and Judd, when you wrote that very important article many years ago, which we're all referencing in our work, about cautioning against seeing for freedom of religion or belief as this block that has to do with this people, and you were saying we need to find ways of understanding people's realities differently. Um, uh, even though you're a diplomat with an international relation, so it works on a very different level in terms of the, the tools and methods of looking at FOB, um, you, you, were very, you were really encouraging towards us in terms of trying for us to work further with the idea of intersecting inequalities. And, and perhaps if, if you were speaking to an audience that doesn't come from a background of looking at intersecting inequalities, what, 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 what value would it be for them? Whether they come from a faith background or an academic or practitioner or community developer or human rights activist, what, what value would there be in it? Mm. Well, to build on what Becky just said, um, these intersecting inequalities are an empirical fact, so talking about them is just a way of talking uh, openly and honestly and I think helpfully uh, about reality. Uh, one other reason I want, I want to highlight is that that sort of language of intersecting inequalities and the language that's been used also by the Creed uh, Project helps to reframe the FORB issue a bit. Uh, in forums like this, we can sometimes get bogged down in terminology between religious freedom and freedom of religion or belief. FORB sounds a little bit wonky in, in a North American context. Uh, in, in Europe, religious freedom just sounds too American. Uh, we can get bogged down in some of those terminological um, debates. Uh, and so I've, I have not been involved in the Creed Project, but I have been so enthused by it, not only because of all the good work that it has uh, accomplished and continues to, but, but also just its very name, using um, uh, religious e equality and then combining it with inclusive development, I think just very helpfully reframes 
the issue and expands the tent of people who uh, might be uh, involved in it. Because whether it's, uh, it, it may be Forb or Earth, uh, but in many places, neither of those terms resonate very much. Uh, both can be quite alien or even alienating. In my own work, while I was at the State Department, when I would travel to Southeast Asia, I wouldn't use either of those terms. I would try to find other uh, cognate terms that might have a bit more uh, cultural resonance uh, in, in, in context. Um, and so religious equality, I think, is, is a really good one. It expands the tent. And then uh, inclusive development uh, further shows the, the intense practical relevance of something like religious equality or, or, or for in that inequality uh, hinders development, it, it, it uh, suppresses the contributions that um, religious communities might otherwise make to their societies, and by contrast, religious equality um, is empowering and enabling and allows religious communities of all sorts to, uh, to contribute in very positive ways to their society. So I'm grateful for that, that, that creative and I think very helpful reframing and linkage that the, the project has made. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shad. Well, we probably have time for a few quick questions, and then, of course, we'll be, you'll be able to catch up with the panelists over coffee and um, in the space. So are there any questions? And if you can kindly let us know whether the question is for Joe, Rebecca, or Judd. No, thank you. Thank you. No, really appreciate it. So, yes, and it's all open access uh, in, um, in the, also the, the reference to the uh, flyers that uh, Emily has very kindly put on the chairs. Thank you, Emily. Thank you for reminding me of this. Well, I think probably then it's much, much easier for us to uh, leave the space for you to come and approach the speakers individually with your questions um, so that also there's time to go to the next session. Thank you so much for being with us and uh, uh, we look forward to learning from you from the informal feedback we will get when we see you um, here today. Thank you very much. Thank you. And thank you to our panelists. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Becky. And thank you, Judd. Thank you very much to our panelists. Thank you very much. Thank you very what much to the speakers today. Um